You are listening to the new Mutual Audio Network. Welcome home. The following audio drama is rated G for general audiences. It's season 12 of the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. The Sonic Summerstock Playhouse is the seasonal series from the Sonic Society in which producers and actors from the modern age of audio drama recreate and reproduce classic old-time radio plays. The Playhouse is open to all producers and creators of modern audio drama to bring to a contemporary audience these classic plays. And now, over to the host of the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse, waiting in the seat in his balcony, Mr. David Alt. Thank you to our announcer, Jack Ward, and good evening, everyone, for another special double feature at the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. We've already had some phenomenal performances based on the mutual broadcasting system's stable of hits, and tonight's no exception. In fact, tonight might be one of the most famous of Mutual series. As the Society, and thus the Playhouse, is a proud partner of the Mutual Audio Network, the spiritual descendant of Mutual Broadcasting, we're thrilled to present on tonight's stage two features of The Shadow, from the Shadow Recreation Society. The Bells of St. Peter's and The Shadow's Revenge. And the curtain rises on our Shadow Double Features from the Shadow Recreation Society Plays. The following is a non-profit, fan-made version of the original radio program, The Shadow. All sound effects have been found on YouTube and voices on castingcall.club. We hope you support the official release. Yours truly, The Secret One. <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, once again we welcome you back to yet another exciting adventure of The Shadow. In this second season, The Shadow will demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. The Shadow, who is really Lamont Cranston, has the hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend, Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the Invisible Shadow belongs. This episode, The Bells of St. Peter's. The Bells of St. Peter's is about a missing movie star, a blood-stained room, and a strange department store sales slip. It will begin in just a moment, but first... As the new school year begins for the children and the adults, make sure you have all the proper items and equipment to help you get through those tough classes. And remember, study hard to get good grades. And now, the shadow and the bells of St. Peter's. The Italian sun is warm and bright on this Saturday morning in April. The streets of Rome are crowded with laughing children and people rushing about to finish up their shopping in time for tomorrow, Easter Sunday. But in the Villa Mantone, an apartment hotel just off the Piazza Barberini, the housekeeper's mind is not on Easter, but on the many apartments she still has to clean. Teresa sets down her mop and broom, pauses before the door of a suite on the second floor, and mutters to herself. Ah, Maron, these Americano movie stars. These are the ones she make us so much trouble. She says, Teresa, do this. Teresa, give me that. Teresa, clean this. A woman so beautiful. 
and so cold, like a fish, see, see, like a fish. Senora Stevens, ah, she's out, making the pictures for the scene. Buono, now I cannot go in. And clean as a wish, no one to say Teresa the stockings, Teresa the... <gasps> Mamma mia! What's happened? Senora Stevens! Senora Stevens! Oh, blood! Everywhere blood! The chairs are overturned! The lamps are broken! I... Oh, I am afraid to look! I'm afraid to open this closet door, she may be... Oh, no one's here. But the furniture, the blood. Oh, oh I'm a sick. I must call the police at once. There it is, Lamont, just up ahead. Studio Elena, director's offices. Oh, Lamont, this is going to be such fun. <laughs> if you're so anxious to visit a movie studio, Margot, you don't have to wait until we came to Rome. They got them in America, too, you know. I know, but this, this is different. A movie directed by the one and only Vittorio Scalza, the famous Italian director. And starring Lydia Stevens, the most intriguing of all American stars. That should be a winning combination, Lamont. Here we are, Signor Scalza's office. I guess we better not. Twenty years! Twenty years in theater! And never, never has such a thing happened to me! Vittorio Scalza! Lamont, listen! Oh, yes. Someone sounds pretty excited. Sorry. Come in! You cannot do this to me! I will not permit it! Never! A hundred thousand... Ah! Signore Cranston! I am so glad to see you. Buongiorno, Signor Scalza. What seems to be the trouble? Trouble? <laughs> oh, everything is lost. Finished. I am ruined. Why? What's happened, Mr. Scalza? My star, Lydia Stevens. She is gone. A disappeared. A vanished. Lydia Stevens gone? See, si. now. One day before the film is finished, with only two more scenes to shoot. The most important scenes in the story. What scenes are they? A love scene. The greatest love scene in the history of cinema. And a death scene. The most tragic one ever written. Without them, I have nothing. A hundred thousand dollars lost. <laughs> Signor Scalza. Why do you say Miss Stevens has disappeared? Perhaps she's ill or delayed? No, 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 no! She is gone. Something terrible has happened to her. What makes you so sure? Last night, I have a dinner engagement with her. A, a reservation. She is to meet me at Donay's. She does not come. I call her apartment. No answer. Today, all day, I call her press. She is not there. Now, I have been calling the police. They are looking for her. Perhaps she's tired, Mr. Scalza, and went off for a few days' rest. Rest? <laughs> you do not know this Stevens woman. She lives only for her work. Nothing, nothing stands in her way, the way of her career. No, if she is not here, it is because she is dead. Or kidnapped, or out of her mind. I, I am ruined. I may as well throw myself in the fiume Tevere. Signor Scalzer, perhaps it's not too late. Perhaps we can help. Help? Uh, can you take her place? Or uh, Signorina Lane? Uh, how can you help? Uh, I don't know yet. But suppose Miss Lane and I start checking on Lydia Stevens' apartment. <coughs> you see? Yes, I see. And the furniture overturned, Lamont? The lamps and vases smash? 
Vittorio Scalzo was right. Something terrible has happened to Lydia Stevens. Teresa, when you came in to clean this apartment before, is this how you found it? Si, senora, I swear. I touch nothing. I call the policia at once. Ask the commissario here. I believe she speaks the truth, Senor Cranston. She called right after Senor Scalza did. Tell me, Teresa, did you hear anything? I hear many things. Shouting, fighting, cursing. From this apartment? How can one tell? We are right near the Piazza Barberini. There is much noise on the streets, and this is a big hotel. Many people shout. Did you hear or see anything last night? Why do you ask her about last night, Senor? Her bed wasn't slept in, Commissioner. So? And Lydia Stevens didn't keep an appointment with her director. Ah, see, si, that is so. Uh, then whatever happened to Senora Stevens may have happened uh, last night. And if that profuse bleeding wasn't stopped in a little while... Lamont, you don't think she might have bled to death? It's possible, Margo. Teresa, tell me. Who come to see this woman, this Americana actress? Nobody. What? It's the truth. She has no friends. When she not work, she stay home alone. Alone? A beautiful woman like that? I heard about her, Margot. She was, I mean, she is, not very sociable. Oh, like the famous Greta Garbo. You're sure, Teresa. You've never seen anyone come here to visit this woman. Never. Uh, only one man. A man? Who was it? Oh, I do not know his name. He's a big man. Big shoulders. Long, curly hair. Very handsome. He gives big tips. I see. A big, handsome man. See, si, see, si, he wear a very fine clothes. Fine clothes? Was he Americano? See, si, see, si, si, he speak English. Eh? You heard him speak? See, si. he have a, a strange voice, like... A, a, a whisper. Ah, and the breeze like this. <sighs> See, si, Commissario, that's the one. Uh, you know him, Commissioner? See, si, and you've heard of him, no doubt. He's the Americano, Tony Fortunato. Tony Fortunato? Mean anything to you, Lamont? Of course. He was deported from America several years ago for his criminal activities. Commissioner. Do you know where I can find him? Certo. We have been keeping, um, how you say, uh, the eye of the eagle on him. We do not like narcotic peddlers any more than you do. Uh, you will find him at the Hotel Flamma. It is on the Piazza Adriana. Lamont, that's right near Castel Sant'Angelo. Grazie, Commissioner. We'll hurry right over. I will go with you. If you don't mind, I'd rather make this visit uh, unofficial. We may get more out of him that way. As you wish, Signor Cranston. Only remember, be very careful. This Fortunato may be dangerous. We'll return to the shadow in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, as we begin our second season of The Shadow, don't forget to check out our Facebook page for updates on future episodes. And as always, if you have any questions about the program or wish to help voice a character for a future episode, feel free to leave us a message, and we will reply as soon as we can. Now, back to The Shadow. Having found a link between Lydia Stevens, an American movie star who has vanished, and Tony Fortunato, an American racketeer who has been deported, Lamont Cranston and Margot Lane decide to call on Fortunato at his hotel in Rome. They are now standing outside the door of his hotel suite. See, si. see, si. gee. Oh. Mr. Fortunato? Yeah. My name's Crandall, and this is my friend, Miss Lang. Yeah, yeah, so what? Well, we're Americans. So what do you want, a 21-gun salute? Oh, I... no, we just thought... You thought I'd drop down and kiss your feet because you come from the good old USA? Well, nuts to that. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Fortunato. You got us all wrong. We're no ordinary tourists. No? No, I... Uh, I'm a magazine writer. I'd like to do a piece about you. An article that... Oh. You would. Oh, very much. You see, back home, most people, especially your enemies, have the idea you're miserable here, that you're living in poverty. They do? No kidding. They think I'm broke? You'd be surprised. 
I want to write an article telling the truth, showing how well you're doing, how you live, the real lowdown. Okay, okay. Good idea. Come on in. Tell you everything you want to know. Think I'm poor, do they? Look around. Find a suite in the hotel. All the furnishings mine. What do you think of it? Why, it's beautiful. How do you like those paintings? They're all genuine. Some by Picasso and Vegas. Nice, huh? Oh, fabulous. How about modern paintings? Ain't these modern? They better be. If I find out anybody's palms off any old-fashioned stuff on me, I'll cool them off. And what a wonderful collection of books. Have you read them all? Uh, not yet. I'm, I'm gonna, though. What a magazine story this will make. Say, that's a very valuable book up there on the top shelf. That copy of Dante. May I look at it? Sure. I'll get it for you. Uh, this one? That's it. I'd like to check the publication date. Uh, here you are. Thanks. Say, what happened to your wrist? What? I noticed the bandage when you reached up. What happened? You're pretty nosy, aren't you? That's my profession, asking questions. Oh, yeah. Well, I broke a shaving mirror last night. Just nicked me. Nothing at all. Pretty big bandage for a little cut. Yeah. Well, you see, uh, I'm a bleeder. Something, uh, something about my blood. I see. Funny thing. What is? Just a while ago, we saw evidence of quite a lot of bleeding. Yeah? Where? The apartment of Lydia Stevens. Ever heard of her? Yeah. The movie star. What were you doing there? We went there to do a story for a movie magazine. But she was gone, and her apartment was in shambles. Blood all over the place. I don't like the way you're talking, pal. What are you getting at? Did you know Lydia Stevens? Maybe. What about it? What kind of dealings did you have with her? Watch out, buddy. You're stepping out of line. If you don't tell us, you'll have to tell the police. You think so? Yes, they know you've been there to see her. You're the only man in Rome who did visit her. So what? Where were you last night? No, no, I wasn't. I ain't seen her in weeks. And now, you two, out! I can get along without you and your lousy magazine. Out! Before I throw you out! Very well. Miss Lane and I will leave. Have you had a you, my friend? We will meet again. I don't get it. I just don't get it. Why don't the police grab that Fortunato and stick him in jail? On what grounds? Murder! The murder of Lydia Stevens! No motive, no means, no weapon, no corpse. They don't have much of a case. Oh, you! You and your law! I'm surprised the police had sense enough to warn Fortunato not to leave Rome. That man's a killer, I tell you! Hello, operator? Operator, this is Mr. Cranston again in room 412. How are you doing on that call to the States? That's right. Uh, Police Commissioner Weston. See, si, see, si, you have? All right. I'll try it anyway. There's a little trouble on the line. Weston? This is Cranston. I said this is Cranston. Yes, in Rome. Rome. I can't hear a word you're saying. What's that? You hear me? Good. Weston, I'd like you to cable me some information. I want all the dope you can get a hold of on one Tony Fortunato. Deported from the States in... Oh, brother, these Italian police stations, you can get lost in these halls. I'll bet the commissario was bowled over when you told him about Weston's cable. I don't know. All he said was, come right over and bring the cable with you. I know I was bowled over. We suspected some kind of connection between Fortunato and Lydia Stevens, but, but this... Strange, isn't it? Her daughter and Fortunato, man and wife. It's unbelievable! Lydia Stevens is so young-looking on screen. She plays ingenues. Who in the world would have believed she had a marriageable daughter? Oh, uh, I don't know. She could have been in her early 30s and had an 18-year-old daughter. Now, that's not so odd. What bothers me is why her daughter would want to marry a, a gangster like Fortunato. Well, he's terribly handsome, Lamont. Dresses beautifully, has loads of money. Yes, and he was riding high when she married him. He lived in a penthouse on Park Avenue, mixed with the theater crowd. Here we are. According to the sign, this is Commissioner Arrow's office. 
Ah, Senor Cranston, Senor Alain. We didn't expect you to be working on Easter Sunday. What choice have I? This Lydia Stevens must be uh, found. Here's a cable, Commissioner. Uh, si, si. Grassi. Uh, you've already informed me of its uh, contents. I guess you never knew Fortunato was married. On the contrary, Miss Lane. Uh, we knew it all the time. What? We know he is married. But we do not know his wife is daughter of Signora Stevens. When he was the Porta Commissioner, did she come here to Italy with him? Un momento. I look in file. <laughs> ah, see. Si. She come here with him. She did? Well, do you know where she is? Uh, see, si. uh, See. I know. Uh, she's dead. She died uh, last year. Bad heart. Uh, much sickness. Oh, what a shame. Yes. Only one thing puzzles me. Why should Lydia Stevens and Fortunato have anything to do with each other if the other link between them is dead? Scusi, Signor Cranston. I see in my file there's another link. Uh, not dead. Another link? Uh, see, si. In uh, Roma, a child uh, was born of this marriage. A boy. Here is the certificate of birth. Use, Lamont. The police have been over this place with a fine-tooth comb, and we've searched it once before. What can you expect to find? You never know, Margot. The clue doesn't have to have a sticker on it. Something here may give us a lead. Well, I don't see what those department store boxes are going to tell you. They're all empty. Yes, I suppose you're... Margot, look at this sales slip. What does it say? You know my Italian is weak. So is mine, but listen. Two pairs of children's shoes, a boy's jacket, size three... Of course. Look at this one. A set of toy trains. 5,000 lire. Toy trains? And a cowboy suit. Size three. Lydia Stevens was buying things for a little boy. That means she knew where her grandson was. Or hoped to find out. Yes. Yes. You're right. Whoever you are. I... I... Lamont, she's fainting. Mrs. Stevens. She's going to... I got her. Mrs. Stevens, are you all right? Margo, some wine, quickly. No. I, I'm all right. Just help me get into a chair. Uh, yes, of course. Steady. That's it. Here. Drink this. Thank you. You... you're Americans? Yes. Friends of Vittorio Scalza, your director. He's been frantic about your disappearance. Where have you been, Miss Stevens? What happened to you? It's a long story. Ever since my daughter died, I... I tried to get custody of her child, my grandson. He's here in Italy. I wanted to bring him to America, but Tony Fortunato wouldn't let me have him. He doesn't like you very much, does he? He's always hated me, just as I've hated him. He ruined my daughter's life. He drove her to her death. He... Well, that's over with now. When I was asked to come over here to Rome to make this picture, I put all kinds of wires. I managed to get court orders and letters from the State Department and whatnot, in the hope that I could get the authorities here to turn my grandson over to me. But Mrs. Stevens, American court orders, they, they wouldn't have any force here in Italy. Tony didn't know that. When he found out I had those papers, he got frightened. So he sent little Tommy to some relatives in the country and came here to my apartment Friday night. He lied to us, Lamont. He said he wasn't here. He was here, all right. He demanded the papers. I refused to give them to him. He got furious. Began searching like a madman, tearing the place apart. I tried to stop him. We fought. Finally, I picked up a vase. Tried to hit him on the head. But he warded it off with his arm. Yes, and cut his wrist. He... He bled all over the place. It was awful. But it didn't stop him. In the end, he found the papers and left. And you didn't go to the police? I didn't want any publicity. And I had no time. I had to leave at once. I was determined to get my grandson. Even if I had to abduct him. But you didn't even know where to go. Yes, I did. Tony let it slip as we were struggling. He mentioned his cousin in Oviedo. I hired a car that night and drove there. And that's why you didn't meet Scalza for dinner? Yes. 
I reached Oviedo about two o'clock Saturday morning. I couldn't do anything until later, of course. About nine o'clock Saturday morning, I drove up close to the farmhouse on the outskirts of Oviedo. I waited for Tommy to come out to play. I thought I would lure him to my car with toys and games, things I had bought several days ago in the hope of finding him. <laughs> I even had a little cowboy suit for him. And? Tommy never came out. It was obvious they'd been warned that I might come. The child had been spirited away. I stayed in the village nearby a second night. But I knew I had lost. I would never have another chance. You... you want that child very much, don't you? Yes. My daughter's dead. I... I did so many things wrong with her. So many. But it's too late now to make it up with her. I no longer have a husband. I have nothing. Nothing but money and things and a career. I have nobody in the world but my grandson. I'd give up everything for him. Perhaps you won't have to, Mrs. Stevens. What do you mean? Well, so far Tony Fortunato has been lucky. The sun has been shining for him. And now? A shadow is about to cross his path. You understand, Giuseppe? Don't let anyone come near the place. Nobody. See, si, see. Si. Yeah, I'll pay you. Don't worry. But if you let anyone take my son, you'll be sorry. You understand? Good. Rivederci. <laughs> Who's that? Who's laughing? The shadow, Tony. <laughs> shadow? What shadow? There's nobody here. You can't see me, Tony. But I'm here. I followed you in. No. It's a trick. It's my imagination. I must be going nuts. Why, Tony? Because your conscience bothers you. Because you're hurting a lovely woman again? She wants my kid. Mine. Why should I give him up? Why should she take him away? Because it's better for him, Tony. And you know it. Better? It's better for him to be with me than in America. Where they threw his father out. Why did they throw his father out? Think back, Tony. Think of the narcotics your henchmen peddled to innocent teenage kids. Think of the kids whose lives no. you ruined. Go away! Go away! That boy of yours. You'll make him suffer for your crimes. Do you want him to grow up like you? A criminal? He needs a mother, Tony. And there is one who wants him. You're trying to soften me up. To make me give up what's mine. I hate that woman. I've always hated her. Why should I stop now? Why should I give in? Listen, Tony. You hear that? The bells of St. Peter's. Just a few blocks away. It's Easter Sunday. Listen, Tony. Perhaps you'll find your answer. Now, a little later, Lamont Cranston and Margot Lane are standing before the magnificent St. Peter's Church in Vatican City, watching the throngs of people go up the steps toward the entrance. The air is balmy, the sky a cloudless blue, a perfect Easter Sunday. Margot is speaking. Isn't it beautiful, Lamont? I can hardly believe I'm really here in Rome on Easter Sunday. Not exactly Rome, Margot. Vatican City. <sighs> Just look at those fountains and those pillars and listen to those bells. Don't they do something to you? Yes, and they eventually did something to Tony Fortunato, too. You mean the way he suddenly gave in? Yes. For a moment he thought of the future, of the days and years to come. And he realized that in the eyes of his son, he'd always be a gangster. His son might have loved him, but he'd be handicapped for the rest of his life by his father's reputation. And Tony, like most fathers, decided he wanted better things in his life for his son. He wanted Tommy to grow up to be proud and happy. Yes, he finally realized that Tommy would have been much better off with Lydia Stevens. Lydia Stevens. What a woman. Lamont. So cold. So hard-boiled. And yet she was willing to risk her life to get that child. She was suffering from the fangs of remorse too, Margot. She kept her daughter hidden from sight. 
neglected her for a career, and finally lost her. And that's why she wanted Tommy. She couldn't undo the wrong she had done her daughter, but she could make it up to her daughter's son. In the end, Lydia Stevens learned that money, the things money can buy, and fame, means nothing when you have no one to love, no one who loves you. They were both lost in a way, Lydia Stevens and Tony Fortunato, but a little child on Easter Sunday showed them the way. The Shadow Program is based on a story copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to yet another exciting adventure of The Shadow. In this month's episode, The Shadow will continue to demonstrate to old and young alike that crime does not pay. The Shadow, who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Years ago, in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. This month's drama, The Shadow's Revenge. In a cell in a large Midwestern penitentiary, two convicts sit at the edge of a lower bunk. One, a big swarthy man, pretends to read a newspaper several days old. The other pretends to tie his shoe. Just got the tip off the boys. Everything is set, Rocco. Okay. You know what to do. Take it, Dud. Uh, suppose we get separated. I told you where the car would be. Meet me there. Check. Here goes. Uh, oh, God! Guard! Uh, Guard! Uh, Man! Uh, sick! Uh, Guard! Uh, Guard! Uh, All right, now what's going on down here? This Guard. He just uh, kneeled over and started uh, moving. Okay, stand back from the door. I'm coming in. Uh, now, what's the matter, Regan? Where does it hurt? Right here. It hurts awful. Where? Uh, I don't see nothing. It won't hurt now. <laughs> what a wallop. You most likely killed him, Rocco. Quick, grab his gun. I got his keys. Come on. Here's the window. Follow me, Regan. I'm going out. All right, Regan, jump. It's all clear down here. Coming down. Now what, Rocco? The car's waiting for us where Annie left it. We gotta make it. Doc! Come on! Come on! They must have found the guard. We gotta run for it. You sure this is the right place? It's deserted. What do you expect Eddie to do, Regan? Set up a flock of floodlights to welcome you. I'll give the signal. Somebody raise the shade in the front room. Okay. That's the all clear. Let's go. Yeah? Okay. Annie, open up. It's me, Rocco. Inside, quick. 
I didn't think you'd make it, Rocco. You two are really hot. Come on, I got some clothes for you in the car. Well, I ask you, is that any way to greet a guy that's been sitting it out and stir for five years? Come here, Annie. Cut it out, Rocco. You ain't got time to doodle around. You gotta get moving. I can meet you out of town someplace. You won't have to meet me any place, baby. I'm not going out of town. What? I got business here first. Business? Not that guy Cranston you're always talking about. That's right, Annie. I swore I'd pay him for that one-way ticket to the big house. You wouldn't want me to renee on a debt, would you? You'll never make it, Rocco. Every copper in the country's got your picture, and it ain't because you're pretty. No copper's gonna get me, Annie. I had a long time to think about it. Five long years in a cheese box. All I could think of was catching with Cranston. Five long years! And I ain't passing up the opportunity now. Well, Lamont, what's this big surprise you said you had? Well, I'm not too sure myself, Marco. Shrevi called me a little while ago and was quite insistent to take a ride with him in his new cab. New cab? Yes, yeah, see, his old one just about fell apart on him, and... Oh, no. Tell me, is it isn't so? What is... <laughs> is that Shrevi perched up there on that handsome carriage? <laughs> now I've seen him. Whoa there, whoa! <laughs> Hello, Mr. Cranston. Miss Lane. Hello, Shrevi. Uh, how do you like my new cab? How do you like it? Shrevi, what's the idea? Well, a new cab I couldn't get, Mr. Cranston, so I figured this is better than nothing. I figured this is better than... Uh, get in. I'll take you for a ride. Well, I... Oh, come on, Lamont. Let's. All right. Where did you go, darling? Right. All right. Uh, down the avenue, Mr. Cranston? You wouldn't know it when you go slow. You wouldn't know it. Well, down the avenue would be fine. Shrevy, what's this? That's a portable radio, Mr. Cranston. Maybe my sale likes romantic music. Maybe he likes... This is really a surprise, Lamont. Let's see what's on the radio. And now, we bring you a special warning from Police Commissioner Weston. Al Rocco and Ed Regan, the two convicts that escaped from Lattimore Penitentiary, are still at large. Police are baffled by the fact that neither Rocco nor Regan have made any attempt to break through the blockade thrown around the metropolitan area. Both men may be holed up someplace at the center of the city, and may... Yeah, what's the idea of turning it off, darling? I'm taking no chances of you getting mixed up in that case. After all, we're out for a nice ride. Oh, Lamont! What is it? Did you see that gorgeous hat in that window? Oh, how do we stop this thing? Uh, I might have known. Wait a minute, I'll wrap. All right. Something wrong, Mr. Cranston? Something's wrong? You gotta stop, Shrevy. Miss Lane saw a hat you'd like to try on. Okay. Whoa, whoa there. Thanks, Shrevy. I won't be a minute, Lamont. Mm-hmm. I'm beginning to see why these things went out of style. A man can go a block without his wife seeing a hat or a frock in the window. Yeah, you'd save money on gas, all right, but... I don't think the horse is going to replace the auto, Mr. Cranston. I don't think it's going to replace. Look, Rocco, this is crazy. You'll be picked up short. We're heading right for the middle of town. I told you before, Annie. You do the drive and leave the rest to me. Annie's right, Rocco. Look at all the cops around. Relax, Regan. This is the last place they'd look for us. Right under their nose. You're not gonna get anything out of this guy, Cranston. Good grief. I know what I'm doing. You mind telling us, Rocco? Maybe like that, we'll feel better. Okay. We're putting the snatch on Cranston. Huh. Just like that. He walks up to you, gets in your car, and says, I'll go peaceful, Rocco. Just like that. Yeah, just like that, Annie. So, you get Cranston. That still don't get you past those roadblocks. You're still electric chair fate, Rocco. That's what you think. This guy Cranston, he pulls plenty of weight with the cops. <laughs> they all know he's a buddy of Commissioner Weston, don't they? Oh, I begin to see what you mean. And when you get in the clear? When I get to clear, Annie, I tattoo my initials on Cranston with a 45. You was wanting something, Mr. Cranston? You was wanting? Shrevy, how long have you been waiting for Miss Lane? Seems like ages. 
Well, we've been sitting here in a hack for half an hour with the... Uh... What is it, Trevi? Trevi, what's the matter? Well, well. If it ain't my old friend. I've been looking forward to seeing you again, Val. Al Rocco? Yes. Al Rocco, remember? I made a date with you the last time we met. I said I'd be coming out to get you. Here I am. Trevi? At the moment I'm engaged, Mr. Cranston. A character is standing no less than ten feet in front of me with a gun pointing right at my stomach with his gun pointing. Ed Regan, I presume. Still a smart cookie, eh, Cranston? Where's Miss Lane? Uh, Miss Lane? Why, I know she'll just hate missing you, but uh, she didn't come along today. She had a little... Here comes Miss Lane now, Rocco. She was in the hat store. No, Margo, don't! Shut up, Cranston. Sorry, Lamont, I didn't... What's all this? Rocco's the name, sister. Al Rocco. I was just inviting you and your friend Cranston to take a ride. You'll never get away with this, Rocco. Don't you realize that we're right in the heart of the biggest city in the world? Yeah, pretty soon, huh? All right, get out of this wagon and into the car. And no fuss. That is, unless you'd like to see your girlfriend splashed all over the sidewalk. All right, Rocco. Come on, come on, get in, Rocco. There's a cop back there, and they're gonna corner us. Okay, okay, inside the car, you two. What about the mucky up on the buck? What do we need him for? Well, not Shrevy. Rocco, don't! So long, sucker! <laughs> Shrevy? Get going, Regan. <laughs> Almost up to the roadblock, Rocco. What are we gonna do? Nothing. Cranston is going to take us right through it. Aren't you, Cranston? You're never gonna make it, Rocco. The police are going to- Okay, slow down. They're stopping cars one by one. Go on. We're next. Remember, Cranston. All right, folks, you'll have to- Oh, hello, Mr. Cranston. You can go through. Hello, Officer Caffey. Look, Caffey- We're holding up the line. We better go along. Look, Officer Caffey, these men- They're piling up behind you, Mr. Cranston. Mind moving along? Go on, you are the officer. I tried. Sure you tried. I told you what was going to happen if you crossed me. Not here, Rocco. There might be another roadblock. Can't you wait till we get to the hideout? Okay, okay. That gives you just about another hour to be healthy, Copper. Lamont. Lamont, are you all right? Uh, my head. What happened, Margot? It was Rocco. As soon as we passed the roadblock, he stopped the car and beat you over the head with his gun. How do you feel? Uh, I'm pretty right. Where are we? I don't know. Some kind of hideout. They threw you into this back room. What's going to happen to us? That's what they think, Margo. They're gonna pay for the vicious murder of Shrevy. How? What can we do? We can't do anything, Margo. The Shadow can. Yeah, yeah, I know. Listen, here they come. All right, Margo, get back. The Shadow's gonna handle these killers. Don't think we can stay out here any longer than we have to. We're staying until I square things off with Cranston. <laughs> What's his trouble? I don't know. <laughs> what are you laughing at, Cranston? I am the Shadow. Make this vengeance quick. Hitting his skull must have set him off his rockers. I am the Shadow. Shut up, Cranston. Get back against the wall. Cranston? <laughs> no. I am the Shadow. Okay. So you're Napoleon. Now get back! Can't see the shadow? No one sees the shadow. Lamont, what's wrong? I can see you. You've... you've lost your power. That ain't all he lost, lady. Stand away from him. No! I won't let you do it! Don't make it too tough on yourself this time. Come on, lady. Get your hands off her! I'll get you out of my hair, sister. Now you're gone. No! Margo! Margo! You killed her! You killed Margo! Lamont Cranston and Margo Lane are being held by Al Rocco and Ed Regan, two escaped killers. When Lamont's power to change himself into the shadow fails, Margo attempts to keep Rocco from shooting Lamont. In the rescuing shuffle, Rocco shoots and kills Margo Lane. You killed her. 
You killed Mago! Rocco, I'm gonna uh, kill you with my bare hands! Kill I'll me! Kill you! Kill you! Kill you for this! Kill you! Kill you! Kill you! It's me, Shrevy! Hey, wake up! Wake up! You've been dreaming, you've been! And I got bruises to prove it! Then. Then it was all a dream? Shadow. You, you're not dead! Not that I heard. Am I supposed to be? Am I supposed to? Guess it was all a horrible dream. It was so real. Dreamed about Rocco and Regan, you and Margo. Where's Margo? That's why I woke you, Mr. Cranston. What happened? Well, I don't know. I figured Miss Lane was taking pretty long, so I went in the store to see. And? Well, the lady says Miss Lane left 15 minutes ago. A man followed her into the store, said something to her, and she left with him. Oh, Shrevy, the dream's coming true. They got Margo. Who? Rocco and Regan, Shrevy. They swore they'd get even with me. They're trying to do it through Margo. That dream must have been real, it must have been. Yes, it was. Very real. Something about it didn't strike quite true, though. Now, what was it? What was it? I know. It wasn't something in the dream. It was something that should have been in the dream. But was it? The girl. What girl? Back when we broke up Rocco's gang, there was a girl who fronted with him. The police couldn't get enough evidence to convict her, but she was in it, all right. And that would explain why the police can't find Rocco, too. Well, how? There must have been someone on the outside to help with that jailbreak tree. We've got to find that girl. She's the key to the whole thing. Well, if we don't know who she is or where she is, won't that be difficult, Mr. Cranston? Won't that be? Not too difficult, Trevi. I got an underworld contact that could find a pier in an ocean. I'll get back to you later, Trevi. I'm going down to see Adolphus Poindexter. Well, Miss Lane, you finally decided to come through. Where... where am I? Who are you? What do you want with me? My name's Rocco. Al Rocco. Oh. So you know of me, huh? Good. We've got a mutual friends, Miss Lane. I'm going to use you to stage a reunion. What do you mean? Lamont Cranston and I have an old debt to settle. What's that got to do with me? I can't contact Cranston without having to worry about the police. But if you call him... I won't do it. Listen. It would be a lot more satisfactory paying Cranston what I own personally, Miss Lane. But if I have to pay him through you, I guess I'll just have to do it. You're bluffing. See, a guard at this prison died this morning, Miss Lane. I've got nothing to lose. They can only hang me once. Well? What do you want me to do? Call Cranston. You'll tell him to drive his car out to the Skyville Highway. Five miles past the blanket there. There'll be a dark sedan waiting. But... The telephone, Miss Lane. I haven't had much time. No, I won't. I... You're hurting my wrist. The telephone! All right. All right. I'll call. <laughs> ah, Mr. Cranston. Alone today? The fair Miss Lane is not with you? Uh, no, Mr. Poitak, sir. Did you get the information I wanted? Oh, very disappointing, Mr. Cranston. Very disappointing. You couldn't find the girl? She dropped out of sight five years ago, Mr. Cranston. Lives a very good life. Not a thing on her. But you did find her. <clears throat> May I know what you want with her, Mr. Cranston? I hate to bother a girl who's gone straight, you know. I expect her to lead me to Al Rocco and Ed Regan. Uh, Rocco? R Regan? Well, good day, Mr. Cranston. My regards to the charming Miss Lane. Mr. Poinex, you don't understand. Miss Lane has disappeared. Don't you see? I think Rocco and Regan have her. Attempt to get to me. But, 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 but Rocco is a killer. Besides, what makes you think this girl is going to lead you to him? Uh, call it a hunch. I just dreamed it up, but I know I'm on the right track. But, Rocco, you sure you wouldn't like to know about somebody else? Gunner Boy? Mr. Cranston? Where's the girl, Mr. Poinexter? I've got to find her. <clears throat> her name's Annie de la Tour now. Sweet girl. Very sweet girl. Where can I find her, Mr. Poinexter? Annie? Annie has an apartment on University Place. Third house from the corner, top floor, a dozen exits, over the roof, in a way like that. You think Rocco and Regan might be held out there? Oh, haven't thought of it. Oh, no, 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 can't be, too small. Besides, Annie must have a place outside of town, spends weekends in some place, never in town. Well, thanks, Mr. Poinex. I'll see that the bartender arranges for your gratuity. Splendid, Mr. Cranston, splendid. Oh, by the way, if you do happen to see El Rocco, be sure not to give him my regards. <laughs> Mr. 
top floor, Shrevy. She might be right here. You want I should make like a messenger boy? Yeah, so I might do it, Shrevy. I got a message for Mrs. De La Tour. Okay, Sonny, I'm coming. Hiya. Didn't expect it. What is this? Merely a social call, Miss De La Tour. We're coming in. That's what you think, mister. I'll think... Of course you think Al Rocco might object. What? Okay, come in. Well, that's what we figured on doing. Now, uh, what's this about Al Rocco? Uh, don't tell me you don't know Rocco. After all he used to do to you? Okay, so you recognize me. But that was five years ago, and I've gone straight. You cops have... I'm a... not a policeman, Annie. What? What are you doing then? Auditioning a quiz show? Who are you, anyhow? What a disposition. My name is Lamont Krenth. Lamont? Heard of me, perhaps? No, I gave up reading the funny papers when I found out Orphan Annie was really a midget. What a card. Look, I don't know how you found me after all these years, but it won't do you any good. I don't know anything. There had to been someone on the outside to fix up that hideout for Al Rocco. That was you, Annie. You want I should give her the third degree, Mr. Cranston? You want I should give her? You stick that homely pan of yours any closer and I'll carve my life history on it, dream boy. You scare me about as much as... Hold her, Shrevy. Don't let her get to that phone. No! No, Keep it quiet, Shrevy. Maybe the break we need. Quiet now. It's Regan, Annie. Annie? Mm-hmm? Listen, I only got a minute. Elle's getting itchy. He wants me to pick you up at the corner of 8th and Convent in half an hour. Will you be there? Mm-hmm. Oh, let me go, you big gorilla. I can't let hold her anymore, go. Mr. Cranston. <sighs> Give me that phone. Give me... too late, Annie. Regan just hung up. Regan! Why you... I'd like to stay here and keep you company, but I got a date. Why you... Listen to me! Sorry, Annie, but you won't get lonesome. I'll leave Shrevy here with you, and I'll give your love to Rocco. When I see him. Rocco's gonna be sore when he finds out I didn't pick up Annie. I waited for her as long as I could. Ah, uh, better give Rocco the signal, or he'll blast me before I reach the cabin. Is that you, Regan? Yeah, Rocco, it's me. Where's Annie? I don't know, Rocco. I told her to meet me like you said, but she didn't show up. I waited for an hour. Something must have gone wrong. You mean... Do you think the cops got her? Hey, we better get out of here. Not until I do what I came here to do. Can't you forget that guy, Cranston? You'll never get away if we keep hanging around here. Come inside. Well, Miss Lane. <laughs> ready to ask you to meet Cranston? I tell you, I don't know. I tried to reach him at his apartment, but he hasn't come in yet. I haven't got time to fool you anymore. I'm gonna. <laughs> Shadow. Thank heavens you're here. Shadow. Yes, Rocco. This is the Shadow. Now we do meet under different circumstances. <laughs> Where are you? Where are you? Right here at your elbow, Rocco. See? <laughs> Quickly, Regan. He won't be a problem if we get him. Oh, but now I'm over here, Rocco. <laughs> uh, uh, I heard all about that guy. He's not human. I'm getting out. Regan, come back! <laughs> Regan! You won't get far, Rocco. I took the trouble of letting the air out of your tires. You devil! What do you want with me? I want nothing, Rocco. But the state wants your life. Listen, Shadow, the minute I hear anything like cops, the girl gets it first. I can't see the Shadow, but I can see you. Well, Shadow, looks like a stalemate. Is it, Rocco? As soon as I took the air out of your tires, I took the precaution of removing the bullets from your gun. The bull? What? Give me that! It's hard to deceive you, Rocco, but I had to distract your attention long enough to take your gun away from you. I'm not dead, Shadow. I'm not. No? That's what you think, Rocco. You hear those sirens? That's the police on the way to make sure you keep that date at the death house. So, Margo, what's bothering you? You haven't said a word for the last five minutes. That girl, Lamont, that 
Fanny. Hmm? Must have known her pretty well five years ago to have known where she lives. What? Oh, darling, I tell you, I never saw that girl in my life. Hmm. Then how is it that you dream about her? I didn't, Margo. That's just the point. She wasn't in the dream. And you missed her. I see. And all along... Now look, darling. No, you needn't explain it to me, Lamont Cranston. Margo, that kind of girl wouldn't go for me. Wouldn't go for you, Mr. Cranston? Oh, you don't know the half of it. Oh, murder. So she did go for him, Shrevy. If she could have got loose, she would have gone for him with a butcher knife. She would have gone for him. Oh. There, you see, Margo? I'll give you my word. Shrevy keeps his hack, there's gonna be two things I'm gonna do. <laughs> what? First, I'm gonna swear off sleeping. Second, I'm gonna nail up that trap door of his. <laughs> <laughs> This story is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to people living or dead is purely coincidental. And a cheer rises from the audience as the applause signals another triumphant conclusion to a night out here at the Playhouse. Our thanks to Shadow Aficionados at the Shadow Recreation Society. And I will see you here in the balcony next week at the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse for another original performance of a classic Golden Age show. And that concludes this week's performance of the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. All productions, features, characters and scripts presented in the Playhouse belong strictly to their respective copyright holders and no copyright infringement is assumed or intended. The Sonic Summerstock Playhouse is part of the Sonic Society and a proud member of the Mutual Audio Network and any shows that continue their run must receive express permission from all parties involved. Join us next week for another new classic. With thanks to our announcer, Jack Ward, I'm your host, David Alt. Good night. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Chauncey Haworth, Mark Slade, and Lothar Tuppen, the demented minds behind the Twisted Pulp Radio Hour, bring you... Twisted Pulp Magazine. A journey beyond surreality to worlds you never knew or hoped existed. Worlds of the supernatural... Worlds of dark satire. Worlds of nightmarish futures. Twisted Pulp Magazine. If you thought the 21st century was weird enough already, think again. Twisted Pulp Magazine. A step beyond your grandfather's pulp. Available at digitalvaudeville.com. That's D-I-G-I-T-A-L-V-A-U-D-E-V-I-L-L-E dot com.